First caller. You got your mic on? Yeah. Mic is on. Should be a green light. Yep. Yeah. Mic is on. Hello? Hello. Hey. Oh, we lost the girl or the lady. We gotta call her uh, back. This is on hold. Oh, she's on hold. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Well, we'll go. We'll go to you first. Hey, how are you? Who's this? This is Patrick O'Toole. Hey, Patrick, what's going on, man? Good. Are we? Li we're not live right now, are we? We are live. Oh, great. Well, I have a question then for uh, Dr. Garami. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Garami, can you see the difference between an air embolism and a particulate embolism with the TCD? Uh, depending on the mood and depending on the device I'm using, a uh, few companies claim that with two different uh, frequency on a TCD you can differentiate, but in my experience I think these devices still fail to differentiate. 50% of the time they are rejecting even thinking about it, so if 50% of the time you don't want to even differentiate, I think that's uh, a bad move. So we tried 2 and 2.5 megahertz on two different frequencies to see the different signature of air versus solid. I think we're not there yet. So uh, we continue our research and trying to find a better tools how to uh, differentiate those signatures between solid of air emboli. Right now, my commitment is I'm counting emboli and the total emboli I count what for me is matter. Okay, great. Mm. Uh, I have a follow-up question as well. At some of the hospitals where uh, we're using um, the cerebral oximetry, of course, and uh, you know, it does change what I do behind the pump a little bit, especially if we're doing a circulatory arrest type of case. But if we were to start implementing the TCD on a regular basis, uh, how do you think it would change our practice specifically? What would we do? Would we be flowing uh, less, flowing more? Yeah, before we go any further, I would like to ask you, uh, what did you observe on a cerebral oximeter when you're cooling your patient? Well, we, we definitely see a decrease in the oxygenation of the brain. No, your, your cerebral oximeter goes up. So when you're cooling your patient down, sometimes you see unrealistic uh, changes. So not just by decreasing the flow, obviously you're going to see decrease of uh, oxygenation, but when you're cooling your patient down, sometimes you see the increase of your uh, near uh, cerebral oximeter. And I think sometimes uh, uh, my explanation, sure, maybe it's uh, less metabolism. This is why you see a uh, higher uh, uh, counting on the nears. But um, I think if you ask an expert on nears, say, oh, my device is best. And, and I just wish that uh, we have more than one sensor. So when you have just two sensors uh, on the forehead, uh, one inch depth, uh, one inch is not covering uh, majority of my uh, middle cerebral territories. Mostly it's covering your frontal lobe and maybe some ACA territories, not even MCA territories. Why my TCD signal is, is properly placed in the proximal MCA, I'm going to cover 80% of the flow going to the brain. Definitely uh, we can improve our uh, monitoring to monitor the vertebral basal system as well so you cover the posterior circulation, which may be even more sensitive for embolization <laughs> than, the, than the carotid system. Uh, but uh, I feel that better coverage is better. So that would be my simple answer going to uh, deep details, comparing your uh, present uh, tool, monitoring your flow versus a TCD. And I just think uh, our issue is that when you buy a TCD device, the, the company just want to sell you a box. They don't want to sell the knowledge. And I think we need to continue the education efforts, what Joe does to really give you the education not just to buy a box, but to really uh, understand what that box shows you. And again, after a few months, few years experience, you will definitely will be comfortable uh, seeing the TCD screens and uh, what you observe. And I think it's a tremendous help um, how you will direct your pump, how you uh, de-air, and how you uh, provide flow during your cases. Well, do you, hold on. Do you, do you see a difference between when you do retrograde cerebral versus integrade? Oh, big time. Because uh, this is this was one of the video I showed mm -hmm. that when you do the retrograde cerebral perfusion, you do have a filter function. Why you do the integrate cannulation? There's no filter Correct. function. So with integrate, even bilateral carotid or axillary cannulation, you have bunch of debris mm -hmm. going up. So I think. I'm a big fan of retrograde cerebral perfusion uh, for the purpose that I can direct the pump 
uh, after opening up the capillary perfusion pressure that yes, you can dial down and maybe even 400 is enough. You don't need to shoot six or 700 for retrograde. Uh, if I see the flow, but my flow is confirmed, not just like dripping blood into your operating right. field, <laughs> but I can really see that it's really reached the brain. So I think on the retrograde cerebral, we can find some collaterals that you assume you're perfusing the brain. No, you can come back from the ECA and it comes back to your mm -hmm. uh, venous system. The true confirmation that indeed you see the MCA flow direction change and you detect that flow in the brain, I think that's the true perfusion. So I think that's the difference between doing a cerebral perfusion mm -hmm. versus monitoring the cerebral perfusion, make sure it's really there and reach the brain. Eliminating the gestalt uh, theory. Uh, <laughs> Just kind of, it looks good, there's blood coming out. And yes, and, and, and I think I remember there was a Austrian uh, gentleman who warned me after we first published that the TCD can detect the flow uh, with the retrograde uh, MC. It's like, well, you're going to, uh, uh, balloon all the brain, and this is Dr. Schilling theory that uh, we are causing edema. We don't see that edema if you're clever and you dial down your perfusion after mm -hmm. you detect the flow. And I think that's where uh, the cerebral perfusion has to be confirmed. So we shouldn't assume. Well, I, I, I learned well, this favorite word is like, we assume too many things. We shouldn't assume. We just detect it. We were objectively measure it. Right. Well, you're, I mean, I think that's exactly right. We just assume a lot. Right. You know, we you 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 cut the aorta open, and we're going retrograde, and we see blood coming back. Mm -hmm. So we assume that's adequate flow because we see blood coming back. But is it? Is it really globally perfusing the brain? Yeah. And I think that's that's the issue. I think that's what TCD uh, offers. Okay, um, Patrick, thank you very much. Can we go to our next caller? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Oh, uh, my name is. Hey. My name is Darina. Hey, Darina. Yes, I have one question. Uh, my question is, what are practices the cardiac surgery team can implement to minimize stroke or tabers? And because you mentioned cere cerebral per cerebral protective devices. And, uh, this, and I'm, my question is, should this be used average, or are studies need first to support this practice as a best practice? So, so let me make sure I got your question right. We had a little bit of a difficult signal. You're asking whether cerebral protection, uh, embolic protection devices should be used on every TAVR and whether it should be used for just standard cardiac surgery? Is that is that what your question is? Well, it was mainly um, for the TAVRs. For the TAVRs, so, you know. Because you said there, that with TAVRs, there's 100% stroke? There is, if you were to measure, if you're, so there's the new cl stroke classification is you have type one, which is that obvious stroke that we talked about. You look at the patient and they're in the bed and you know they had a stroke. Um, and then there's the type two stroke uh, which is the new classification, which is any new lesion on DWI. And these are the subtle changes that you see in patients and they're both cumulative and ongoing. And sometimes they even get worse over the course of time. And when the cardiologists, in, when they're studying any new device in a clinical trial, they now have to, I believe this is correct, you correct me if I'm wrong, but they have to consult the patient and advise them the difference between class one and class two stroke and that their risk of stroke in the class two is essentially 100%. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? So indeed, there's certain um, trials demonstrated 100%. Majority of the data I showed today, that was like 80, 86% of the patient had DWI lesions. Right. Uh, and indeed, uh, if we have an FDA approved uh, uh, protection, uh, it still sounds like a choice for having a protection or not. And I think what I hear from your question was all of the TAVR should be done with protection. And I think uh, I'm on that side that if we have an FDA approved device for that indication, 
all the tethers should be done with zebra protection when we know uh, what our complication. And I think this is where we need to go back with our honesty and saying that uh, with the 100% DWI type 2 stroke, we saw the decline of 10% uh, clinical stroke down to 3%. But I think the uh, clinical strokes are still, you know, 3%. We're going back to our accepted uh, complication rate should be zero. I think uh, we still have room uh, to protect the brain. And uh, at the moment, I do not see the cerebral protection used in every Tever cases today. I mean, that's three out of 100. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. And let me, let me throw this at you. So, so, so first question or, or first added question to you is, um, OK, thank you. We're short. We're running a little over, but I hope you don't, all don't mind. Uh, what, what's going on, dude? Did we finish that? Oh, I think. Well, let me let me finish up on this thought, if I can, um, and I'll be and I'll be right there. Um, she was asking whether every patient should that's getting TAVR should have embolic protection devices. Should every patient having TAVR, regardless of where they are, have TCD monitoring? That's to you, and then I have a question for you as well. Um. Today, I would say it's impossible. I think there's so many uh, centers doing TAVR and they're focused on TAVR that the TCD is not a uh, potential uh, equipment available for everywhere, but it, it, it should be a best monitoring uh, for stroke prevention. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about stroke prevention, when it's really count, uh, we move the patients from general anesthesia to awake patients. So I think that's also change our method of monitoring. If you do have a wake patient during the TAVR, that's the best neuro monitoring because you can ask the patient, how are you doing? Count backwards uh, and again, have a direct communication to the patient. You can see the clinical stroke that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, uh, on a wake patient, I see the best monitoring is talking to the patients. When you do have general mm -hmm. anesthesia, I think TCD is a, should, it's a, it's a must for every case. Well, I'm not getting tavern. If I do, I'm not getting it awake. I can assure you of that. That's not going to happen. I don't want to know what the hell's going on. Um, <laughs> so, or, or you want TCD on, on your head. So that's your yeah, other choice. I want something. So let me ask you something. As a, as, as a surgeon, you go in to talk to a patient. Mm -hmm. Would you how, are you, how are you going to approach saying to them, let's say you were a tavern advocate, how would you go in and explain to them Look, uh, we're, we want to do this TAVR on you. We don't want to do an open procedure, um, which I think is still better. But uh, we want to do this TAVR, uh, and you've got an 80% to 100% uh, risk of having new lesions in your brain, which could result in a stroke or cognitive dysfunction or whatever it is. H how do you reconcile? How do you do that? I'll just give the analogy to uh, SAVR, you know, surgical AVR, which when we had embolex available, uh, every aortic valve I did, not every cardiac case, I put an embolex in. I sent off the filters for the first two or three years, and they always had something. Uh, only one or two times anything, you know, as big as your fingernail, but that does happen as well. Um, so, and I would counsel them, and I literally would spend the time with them and say, look, you're, I'm putting a filter in. Uh, it may or may not get paid by your insurance. So if you're okay with an extra 300 bucks being charged to you to minimize or decrease the um, risk of stroke, um, if you were my mom, I'd do it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I put it carte blanche into everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because of that experience of always seeing something, um, you know, microscopic, microscopic, uh, and knowing that there's always something, whether it's clinical or subclinical, going to the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's without TCD monitoring, that's without cerebral oximetry in a community setting. Um, again, it just makes sense. You're scraping out a valve and putting one in, and now you're in a tavern situation where you're not taking the valve out. It's a lot, it's a little less controlled, although it's borne out to be a, a very safe operation. I would, I would filter everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's available, I'd filter. And there are a lot more filter devices available for TAVR than there were for open TAVR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. abs absolutely. You want to go to our lab? I, I think we have time for one more call. Roger? Yeah, they hung up. They hung up? Oh, do we have yeah, any? Have we have anybody else? Yeah, no, sir. No? Okay. So, uh, listen, I want to, th you want to, let's, let's transition out of this, I think, with just some music and we'll take a break and then 
we'll put Dr. Matoyer's video on uh, that he can narrate about the uh, mitral valve, simplification of minimally invasive mitral valve. I want to thank everyone for attending this session. I want to thank particularly Dr. Garami for coming all the way up here from the med center, the big med center in Houston, Houston Methodist Hospital and uh, giving us a great, I think, overview of uh, TCD and its application. I'd like to see it used more commonplace. Um, I'd like to be, see us using it um, and seeing what we're doing. You know, going back to the, there's these, no, these unknown unknowns, as Don Rumsfeld said, and it'd be really <laughs> nice to know what we are actually doing and if it would change anything that we are doing, whether it be the tools that we're using, the, the conduct of the perfusion, pulsatile flow, vacuum assist, non-vacuum assist, whatever it may be, I, I, I would just love to know. And I, I, I hope that it comes a point in time where, uh, where, where TCD becomes a standard of care for any patient who is going to be undergoing a, cardi a procedure requiring the use of extracorporeal circulation. I think it's extreme, I think it's extremely important. I'd want it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you.